Dear parents, I'm leaving home for Europe and perhaps Navy and hence the world. Do not know how long I shall go for. Pay for bike transport out of birthday money, also money for possible fine from accident in South Wales. You wouldn't understand reasons for leaving, but don't contact authorities, as I shall write periodically. Do not worry about me. Tim. P.S. Pay postage on parcels and cancel driving test. Tim Page left home when he was 17. He became a war photographer and a Vietnam legend. His story is told in a few pages of Michael Hare's celebrated book, Dispatches. I had heard about him even before I came to Vietnam. He was 23 when I first met him, and I can remember wishing that I had known him when he was still young. He worked his way across Europe as a cook in the hotels drifting east through India, through Laos, and into Vietnam at the age of 20. One of the things that everybody said about him was that he hadn't been much of a photographer then. He'd picked up a camera the way you or I would pick up a ticket. But he would go places for pictures that very few other photographers were going. People made him sound crazy and ambitious, like the 60s kid, a stone-cold freak, in a country where the madness raced up the hills and into the jungles, where everything essential to learning Asia, war, drugs, the whole adventure, was close at hand. No time to hesitate is through No time to wallow in the mire Right now we can only lose And our love become a funeral pile Come on baby, light my fire Come on baby, light my fire Try to set the night on you have to photograph all this? What makes anyone, anybody want to do anything? I prefer to take pictures of something which is totally black and white, total reality, than I would of something which is... Uh, I mean, who really wants to watch the Queen walk around, you know? I mean, it's just not interesting. Uh, at least here you're seeing history made, you're seeing you're seeing something exciting. But it's, it's violence, and you seem, in a way, to be part of it. Um, maybe I dig the violence. Yeah, I dig what is violent. I dig violent music. Uh, but you've got to remember, this is still the East. There's still a lot of very, very soft Oriental things going on here. The first time he got hit, it was shrapnel in the legs and stomach. That was at Chulai in 65. 
The next time was during the 1966 Buddhist riots in Da Nang. Head, back, arms, more shrapnel. His friends began trying to talk him into leaving Vietnam, saying, hey, Paige, there's an airstrike looking for you. And there was. It caught him drifting around off course in a swift boat in the South China Sea. Page took over 200 individual wounds, and he floated in the water for hours before he was finally rescued. In April, I got a call telling me that Page had been hit again and was not expected to live. A helicopter he was riding in was ordered to land and pick up some wounded. Page and a sergeant ran out to help. The sergeant stepped on a mine which blew his legs off and sent a two-inch piece of shrapnel through Page's forehead above the right eye and deep into the base of his brain. He retained consciousness all the way to the hospital at Long Bin. They said he would live, but that he would always be paralyzed on his left side. Once I was alive, once I'd woken up and I was out of surgery and they'd taken the catheters out and I was unplugged from all the tubes, I thought this is dead easy. I just figured it's going to take, you know, it's a six month job. I didn't realize it was much more than a six, you know, it wasn't even a six year job, maybe it's not, still not over. I'm a little freaked about my inability to recover. Like today, I tripped on a, on a paving stone and went over. Now, before this, I would be able to recover my balance. My balance is just way off. I mean, I can't go up step ladders and stuff like that anymore. I do, you know, but I, it gives me, you know, creeps. I, I don't have the confidence in my body because I know my body can't react. I find it also fascinating because I haven't been here so long, and obviously it's changed a lot. Um, the changes are boring. The changes aren't boring. I choose not to make them look boring photographically. I mean, I'm not bored by being back. I'm excited by being anywhere. I don't care if it's anywhere. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I'm excited by just being. And I like taking pictures. I love the little old ladies. There's something about little old ladies, all oh, that sort of jars of baked beans and cups of tea. I mean, and it sort of seems to sort of satisfy the equation of always be in England. I mean, they seem to be an institution. You know, <laughs> baked beans and cans and cups of tea. You know, toast is off. And these kind of rather silly games you play, and, and people putting and, and junk for sale. I mean, it's all in the aid of this, you know, religioso syndrome. The whole thing is just quaint. I think I've possibly detached myself from worrying about my parents. And now I start to worry a bit more because I'm getting old and you know what happens if one dies and this kind of stuff. But somehow I have my own life to lead. And I, I just figured that like if I did a good job, that they'd be proud. Okay, thanks. I had a very happy childhood. I, I mean, I don't remember disastrous things. I mean, I had love. I weren't that broke. I, mean, I ate well. I mean, I played well. I mean, I didn't have a... I loved my childhood. He's a born survivor. He's got away. He's got away with it. And, uh, you know, it must be marvellous to have done all this. And I th I, that's how I feel about it. Right from when he was 
fairly young. He had said he'd always wanted to travel. And I think I had found a kit bag in the bedroom, hadn't I? With the Union Jack yeah. um, sort of on top of it. And that's, I thought, ah, something's imminent. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I didn't tell, I didn't say anything to him. And he didn't say it was that day that he was going. And I went and looked and the kit bag had gone and the note was there. So I guessed then. That he well, wanted to travel, didn't oh, he? Oh, yes. Well, I'd always rather encourage that as well, simply because, as I think, uh, uh, you know, that I was so nervous myself when I first had to travel ar around a bit and that sort of thing. And I thought, well, if I can get Tim indoctrinated early, that may solve it. But, of course, when you then find that he's on his way to Kathmandu from Amsterdam in <laughs> Volkswagen, you begin to wonder whether that was altogether a good thing. But, uh, it's... They, they put it called the Stench of Death at Dong Lak, which is a little tiny village just outside of um, Binhua. And the Viet Cong had got into this village and they'd been stopped. They made a last ditch down in a church, a Catholic church. <laughs> there was all these penance and priests lounging around, sort of bemoaning the fact that their little kind of, their parish had got like blown off the map. <laughs> I mean, there was no more Dong La. And I met one fire team, a three-man fire team, and they all smoked dope, and I had some incredible stuff from Laos. And one guy walked around all day long making bamboo pipes and wrapping raffia around them when he wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything going on. But they were all little, they were all little strange, these guys. Like, this place was crawling with leeches, and these guys would sit down on the paddy dikes with their feet, like, up to their knees in water, and the leeches were just swarming all over them. They were so, like, just spaced out. This is an ARP. You know what an ARP is? It's an aerial reconnaissance platoon member. They'd sneak around, real sneaky, with mean, armed to the teeth, but with North Vietnamese weapons. I mean, he's heavy duty, this guy. These guys were VCS, Viet Cong suspects. I think they were Viet Cong. All the times they saw prisoners taken, you could tell who Viet Cong was because there was hate in his eyes for the white man. It's the classic sort of capper on the hill, Spanish Civil War, picture of somebody being blown away without the head coming off. As much as the guy here is already dead and the guy here is already wounded, there's men going out to get him. It's possibly the most active battle picture I ever took. It's not a post shot, it's right there. You have an eight, six day or an eight day, I forget what it was, to go out and take pictures of GIs using gas for the first time in tunnels. You know, as they use these kind of pepper fog machines, which pump gas and smoke into tunnels and drive the Viet Cong out of whatever exits are on the tunnels. And then boom, 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 they just gun them down. So for the, the first day out, there were 26 correspondents went on the, on the operation. Nothing happened the first two days, and the correspondents dissipated, and there was no more correspondents left. Now, it's the only correspondent left. I'm guaranteed eight days. So what have I got to lose? Until they use the gas, I'm laughing. Nothing happens. I kept shooting pictures, kept shooting pictures, kept shooting pictures. And on the third day, when there's no more correspondence left, the fools came to a, a sign in the road. And on the side of the road, it said, all Americans who read this sign will be killed. And boom! Instant ambush. In five seconds, there was 19 dead and 35 wounded. 
and that was it. And I carried guys out, and legs came off of my arm, and I mean, all that horror of war. It's not the most thought about picture, but in terms of a snapped moment, and the fact that I took it with a 105mm lens and I got the horizon straight when I'm basically totally freaked and I have no idea what's going on around me except it's unmitigated hell. I think I did a good job at that time and so I could have done them better. But then what did one know then? One was 19, 20, 21. And in terms of formative years photography, I don't think I could have done a better job Back in the world now, and a lot of us aren't making it. The story got old, or we got old. A great deal more than the story had taken us there anyway. And many things had been satisfied. Or so it seemed, when after a year or two or five, we realized that we were simply tired. We came to fear something more complicated than death. An annihilation less final, but more complete. And we got out. A few extreme cases felt that the experience there had been a glorious one, while most of us felt that it had been merely wonderful. I mean, it's a heavy trip, Vietnam. It's, I mean, it's not like it's not like going to Brighton for the day. You know, it's not like. Um, it's a little more serious than a dentist. It doesn't just dissipate when you leave. Because most people, I mean, it's so cool, it's part of the, part of the era, it's been in formative years, as it were, we spent there. And you become a little warped, a little out of shape. Because you haven't been really back in touch with decency for a long time. And war is not very decent. There's nothing, it, it might be groovy, cool, always hits bullshit. But basically, it's really just, it's, it's awful. You can get off on that and, and, you know, and enjoy it. Because you're there and you're there because you want to be and also because you're making a good living at it. And you're getting the rocks off. It takes a long time to sink in. I met more people who become really close friends then and now. I mean, a lot of haphazard friends, these people. I mean, you went through the worst thing in the world with them, and sometimes you saved their ass, sometimes they saved your ass. But, like, it was a very, very valuable experience. There was, a, there was only a certain group of people that one really wants to be with who experienced it. I mean, one's friends are people who were there, who shared it. And you don't, you, you have a short circuit, you have like a sort of a shorthand between each other. And when there's crises in one's life, you know you can pick up the phone anywhere in the world and call collect and say, man, I've got this problem. And they know what you're talking about. They know your own agonies and ecstasies. I think as long as you smile at people and you're not embarrassing them and you try to be as much of, of what's going on as possible and you're careful as possible not to upset what they're doing. Don't get in the, you know, don't get in their way. I mean, there's a machine gun I've got to set up and blaze away. Don't get down from the gun. Straighten the camera. Okay. 
in the bike. Yeah, show me a worm then. I ain't the worm, it's him. Well, show me a worm then. What's that? Oh, the worm up, one of them terrible things you got. I ain't worm. What are they? Him, seed. Well, show me one then. That's great if you can smoke that stuff, you know. Hemp, cannabis right. sativa. Right. Roll it up, keep going. Well, give us a look then. National health teeth, you can't go wrong, right? <laughs> and I have no desire to rush anymore in life. I'm not in a hurry. I mean, that's a question of getting older. Oh, you're, you're screwing me, shut up. Turn around and look in the camera. Both well, of you. As soon as we all get older and age a bit, I mean, we're not in quite so much of a hurry, you know, rush around, like, you know, run ourselves ragged. Not, that's not just a direct result of Vietnam. I mean, the process was definitely arrested and slowed down in my case. In retrospect, the stuff was disgusting, horrific, inhumane, I mean, all the worst things you can think of. But if you had stopped and you had reacted to it in that way, then you wouldn't be able to function. You would not be able to function as a, a critical, neutral journalist. I want to prove that I'm no longer a cripple and I can still take a fine picture. And I'm rather sick of not getting work when I think, and a lot of my peers who I respect think I'm as good as anybody they know. When I have an assignment, which is different from the average day up, and one is trying to always conceive that the day is an assignment. Every picture you shoot, even be it an idle snap, and using the word snap in a sort of a very loose context, that the snap is going to be valuable. It was also deja vu. There was all these kind of. There was a riffraff of Saigon. I mean, the half. I mean, there's a lot of Chinese ethnic minority. I mean, it was mixed. The mainly half Chinese or Amwati Shikin were. And it was just like being back on the streets of Saigon to a certain. From one degree, I mean, it's, I mean, it's the middle of Hampshire, New Forest, and it's all wrong. Chicken. I think I know no more than about a dozen words of Vietnamese and as a charge, go right, go left, let's retreat, let's get laid, water, beer, opium, tea, mm. very basic. Mm. 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 I'm find a cup of tea now. Choi duk oi. Choi duk. Choi duk oi, I'm telling you. Yeah. Most of the older people seem to be within the sort of 20 to 35 bracket. And they were all the cowboys from Saigon, the pimps, and the people who took you know, GIs home after hours and their motor scooters. People who are sort of totally Coca Cola cultured.
What they're going to do for a work over here, I have no idea. They're totally alienated. And the alienation was so obvious when stuck in the middle of an RAF camp, which doesn't look even like a, a military base in Vietnam. talking more and more about the war, often coming close to tears when he remembered how happy he and all of us had been there. One day a letter came from a British publisher asking him to do a book whose working title would be Through With War and whose purpose would be to once and for all take the glamour out of war. Page couldn't get over it. Take the glamour out of war? I mean, how the bloody hell can you do that? It's like trying to take the glamour out of sex, trying to take the glamour out of the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know that, it just can't be done. Of course, coming back was a down. After something like that, what could you find to thrill you? What compared? What, what did you do for a finish? Everything seemed a little dull. Heaviness threatened everywhere. You left little relics lying around to keep you in touch, to keep it real. You played the music that had been with you through Hue and Quezon and the May Offensive. Tried to believe that the freedom and simplicity of those days could be maintained in what you laughingly referred to as normal circumstances. Questions of Tim. Can you stand up and ask your questions? How does an adventurous young boy get to be a war photographer? <laughs> By putting one foot in front of the other one and just keep going. Next question. You talked about we. You know, we got shot or we lost a lot of guys. What was your status as such? It says on my press card, it says non combatant, time life freelance, uh, blood type O, religion nil. Uh, my thumbprint and my fingerprint, a little picture of me. Um, I could do what I wanted to. You were free. Once, once you were recognised by the people who were there as being a crowd, said you could just basically do what you wanted to. It's as simple as that. Uh, this comes back to the question that this chap down here asked about your non-competent status. You said you used a gun. I have. I killed once, and I only carried a weapon when I, when I had to carry a weapon when I was asked to carry one. I always figured if I needed a weapon, there'd be plenty lying around. Because what the question I was going to ask was, if you had a gun, then uh, surely this, this prejudice you, well, maybe had no chance... If I, if I went out on a BC. small patrol, a special forces patrol, raiding into Cambodia, there's six dudes. They ask you to carry a weapon, and you're not going to argue about it. But I, don't, I didn't carry one on principle. It's bloody heavy. A weapon is only as good as, as, good as the ammunition you carry. 
If you're packing four cameras, six lenses and 50 rolls of film, as well as your bedding and all your food, where are you going to put the weapon? Michael Hur was consistently critical of the Marines and uh, equally complimentary of the 1st Cav. What's your uh, view? You've got to remember that Marines always had the cast off from the Navy. And they were Navy supplied, so they, they, had the last, they had the junk helicopters, the junk tanks, the junk jeeps. The CAV came in with all the goodies and PIOs and all the facilities you could dream of. So they're nicer to be with, but not as good. I don't think they're as, as diligent or as hard hitting. Um, Michael Hurst said that if the same concentration of energy as was used on the war had been used on construction before the war ever started, it would have lighted up the country for a thousand years. But it wouldn't have been much of a media for you war correspondents and photographers. Would you rather have photographed the construction than the destruction? I mean, I did constructive stories over there, but I, mean, I was over there to photograph a war. Inadvertently, but I was there. I couldn't stop the yes, war. But I mean, you didn't think the war was glorious? Of course it was. All wars glorious. I'm not saying I want to go back to any, but I mean, it was fun while I was there. Except for the people who are killed. That's war. I mean, there's traffic. That's uh, normal life, and people die. So you still feel that it is a glamorous experience rather than just you've been brutalized by it? As a kid, I wanted to drive a steam train. I wanted to drive a jeep, a truck, a tank. And suddenly you can go out and fly in a phantom bomber, fly in a helicopter, take the controls. Um, that's kind of glamorous in its own sense. Do you think as well as somebody's going to pay you to do it and make you famous. What do you do these days? Oh, I masturbate a lot, I smoke a lot of dope, I hang out, um, I take a lot of pictures. Um, I, I'm a professional myth. No, it, it's boring. You tried to get the same highs here that you'd had there, but none of that really worked very well. The friendships lasted, some even deepened, but our gatherings were always stopped by longing and emptiness. Smoking dope, listening to the mothers and Jimi Hendrix, remembering compulsively, telling war stories. But then there's nothing wrong with that. War stories aren't really anything more than stories about people anyway. Oh,